folks, welcome into that betting show for April 12th, 2019, your one-stop shop for all your sports betting needs. He's Teddy Savransky. Give him a follow on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. I'm Donnie Seymour at Right Side VP. The Masters, Teddy, gets underway. Interesting day. First half, you know, minus twos, minus threes, and then it looked like all hell broke loose late. But let's not forget the old timers, Teddy. Bill Mickelson, Tiger Woods did very good yesterday. Sure, sure. Of course, we've got the updated odds for round two, or after round one, I should say. Kupka, the leader, at plus 470. DJ, plus 600. DeChambeau, plus 650. Rom, plus 1100. Mickelson, sitting alone in third place right now, plus 1200. And, of course, Ricky Fowler at plus 1400. Those are the leaderboard, or the the top uh, golfer odds uh, for the Masters after round one. Obviously, we'll see these odds bounce all day, all night, and into round three on Saturday. Yeah, Tiger Woods struggled a little bit with his putter yesterday, but as he left the golf course, it looked like he was going to set up for a minus three, but finishes at minus two, which is a great round because over the past you know years, he hasn't gotten off to the best starts, usually finding himself down seven or eight shots after day one in a major tournament. Phil Mickelson poured it on late, grabbing into it. But again, we're talking about a 48-year-old golfer here heading into the weekend, but the game that he has, same thing with Tiger Woods, really translates well to Augusta. If you're going to be aggressive, if you can have great iron play, you can really score. But the one thing I always find myself getting back to, Teddy, is some of these younger guys with the chops. DeChambeau currently leading right now with minus seven. Uh, Ian Poulter, minus four. Jason Day, who if you didn't see yesterday, Teddy, picked up his daughter on the putting green before the round started, hurt his back and had to get stretched out. Looks like he was a 60-year-old man, but yet he finds himself today, Teddy, in the top three. (laughs) Exactly. Because what are the headlines? The headlines are Tiger and Phil. Tiger and Phil. Those are the two biggest name golfers out there. They've been around for 20 years. They've been making headlines for 20 years. They're not necessarily the best bets. Oftentimes, it's the young up-and-comers who make a name for themselves right here in this tournament. You won't catch me with my money on Tiger or Phil. No, it should be a lot of fun to watch. Can you imagine, Teddy, we talk about the NCAA tournament coming down to the Final Four in the final. Imagine the ratings if it was Duke and North Carolina in the final, Minneapolis. I can only imagine if it's Tiger and Phil in the last grouping on Sunday at the Masters. You would set all types of records here for Masters coverage. But we'll find out. We'll get you ready for over the weekend. The next show we have, Teddy. We'll be talking about who actually was crowned Masters champion. But last night in Major League Baseball, really interesting. We saw a lot of comebacks, Teddy. And I don't know if this is uh, astronomy or whatever it would be or astrophysicists. Seven to six was a key number yesterday. (laughs) It sure was. And most of it had to do with bad bullpens and or lineups that are hitting the ball. Certainly, you talk about the Mariners. They're hitting the ball, you know, uh, down 6-3 late. Two out, two run triple to tie the game in the ninth and then win seven, six in extra. The Mariners are 13 and two right now. Do the markets care? Not even a little bit. They're still home dogs to Houston tonight. The Red Sox, I thought they were in big trouble. Well, they were in big trouble last night. Down five, nothing early. Chip away, chip away, chip away. Lo and behold, they win seven to six as well. And of course, the Padres, five run lead. Oops, wiped out in the sixth. Doesn't matter. <laughs> they score the final one, seven to six finale. And the Padres, boy, they sure look real to me. I don't think they're going anywhere. You ask me right now, the NL West, a two team race, San Diego and LA. You know, Teddy, we talk a lot about sports there and sports gambling. The one usual moniker that you have is every game is usually clocked. You know, the NBA, time's going to have to run out. Depends on how much your lead is, how much you can come back. The NFL, NCAA football, NHL, whatever sport you're dealing with. But when you have baseball, it's not about a time frame there. It's about out. So we see a lot of these bullpen melts, a lot of these huge comebacks, because it's not saying there's no way they can come back in the last three minutes of the game. Heck, you can have a 35 or 40 minute inning to come back. It was a lot of interesting stuff. And the one thing I was watching yesterday, Teddy, is if you were sitting on that Royals ticket and I said to you, Teddy, before the game, there's going to be a key play with two outs, but Billy Hamilton is going to be able to run down this ball in center field. You say, great, that's exactly the guy I want out there. And he drops the ball, crashes in the defense, gets hurt, and then your ticket loses, <laughs> Teddy, as it goes yeah. to extra innings. Yeah, and of course, yeah, at least he got hurt. You know, well, I, I don't mean to say this. Uh, I'm going to say it fairly innocuously, but it's like if the guy that you're counting on screws up, he better be hurt. <laughs> and that's what happened with Billy Hamilton yesterday. That the, the big loss. I mean, I don't know. Kansas City's got a, is a mess to begin with, and they certainly haven't gotten any better with another late game meltdown last night. 
Yeah, Mitch Haniger t- tattooed that ball, but you saw Billy Hamilton tracking it, and he just misplays it at the wall and then springs himself on the wall. It's one of those things saying, it might look better if I actually get hurt here and leave the field. Oh, he tried his best, as opposed to the narrative saying, boy, you can't drop that ball. What are you doing out there? But hey, it is Major League Baseball, and keep in mind, Teddy, we're only in the first two weeks of April. We have the entire summer to talk about these circumstances. Overnight line movers will get to some Major League Baseball, but... We do have to tell you, SPRodds.com, the single place on the internet. It's exactly where you want to go to get all these line movements, updates, and changes right through sportsbookreview.com. Corbin on the mound for the Nationals, and that line is rising. Ultra market steady, open up around 160, rising to about 180 with a total of eight. Williams and Corbin on the mound tonight in the, in the capital. Yeah, I mean, SBR Odds is the kind of site that you have running on your computer all day long. You know, you're just tracking, following, hey, waiting for something to pop up. It really is worth just... Oh, pop it open and keep it open. When we talk about this game in the Nationals, yeah, Washington's got the 7.79 bullpen ERA, worked in the majors, but they got six shutout innings out of their bullpen in the win over Philly on Tuesday, and the bats are going nuts right now where they scored 25 runs in the last two games. Dave Martinez, Washington's manager, quote, I said it all along, we're playing well. Our bullpen's starting to pitch the way they're capable of pitching, and we're swinging the bats. I'm proud of the guys. Yeah, the betting market's paying attention. Washington looks pretty good in early season play and certainly had a very successful road trip, taking two out of three from each of their top two, well, two of their top three uh, NL East rivals. Boston Red Sox, Teddy Lesson, as we talked about it, left for dead, come back with an inspiring win in the bottom of the ninth inning. Now the line actually creeped up to around minus 300 earlier today, but peeling back here, Hess is on the mound versus the lefty Rodriguez. Across the markets, as we take a look at SBRodds.com, minus 243 at Pinnacle, minus 255 at Chris, minus 250 at Intertop. So that line coming down a little bit lower, but that total still sticking at the double digits with 10. Yeah, and a lot of this has to do with Baltimore. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, there's momentum for the Sox. That was a nice win. That was a win they had to have yesterday. And the way they did it, rallying from a 5 nothing deficit, certainly positive momentum moving forward. But this is all about Baltimore. And the Orioles' last five games, they do have one win. The four losses, they lost 13-2, 15-3, 10-3, and 8-5. to Every one of those games flying over the total. Their bullpen is shot already, and they can't get anyone out. That's a bad news. That's, that's a very bad news against a Red Sox lineup that is finding their way offensively. Understand why the total went up. Understand why the Red Sox money came in. Although there has been some buyback. The market's still not excited about laying $3 with Boston at this stage of the season. Teddy, looking at a game a little bit later tonight between Houston and Seattle. Line opened offshore at Pinnacle at 8.5, now sitting at 9. We did have some 9.5s across the board, but it looks like it's settling in right now at 9. It's Miley and LeBlanc on the mound. The one thing that interests me about this game, obviously T-Mobile Ballpark in Seattle, a huge place. Ball doesn't carry well. And, of course, in Seattle, what are we looking at? Maybe a little rainy conditions there, 55, 60 degrees. So you never get that true muggy conditions that you get maybe in New York City, Philadelphia, or down there in Miami. But taking a look at each one of these ball clubs, slaying left-handed pitching, waiting on base average, Teddy, 430 and 397 between both of these teams going after lefties. We might see some fireworks here, but hey, you got to hit that ball a long way up there, Teddy, to get it out. No question. That being said, the Mariners have hit all year. I mean, this Seattle offense, is the numbers are pretty stunning. They scored six runs or more in nine of their last 10. They've gone seven, two, and one of the over uh, during that span. The Astros, who came out of the gate where they hit, I think they hit 100 with runners in scoring position in the first week of the season. Well, that problem has come and gone. They just scored 36 runs in their 6-0 and homestand. So we've got two lineups that are crushing the ball right now, legitimately. And the market's not very excited about what we would call a pair of tired retread starters. Yeah, two lefties that aren't going to chuck it 99 miles an hour. Market's expecting fireworks, and you can understand why. The NBA is back, Teddy. We finally get over this reprieve of a couple days off to get ready for Saturday and Sunday playoff basketball all day long. Take a look at the first game they have here. Better get your passports out, folks. Magic, head north to take on the Raptors. The Magic right now currently sitting as an 8.5-point dog. Total, 212.5 money line split, 315 and minus 400. 5 o'clock is going to take place at Scotia Bank Center in the Toronto. The Magic, Teddy, 45 and 35, excuse me, 44 and 35 against the number in all lined games. 29 and 22 as a dog. 22 and 18 on the road. The Raptors, 38 and 42 overall in the season against the number 29 and 36 as a favorite and only 18 and 22 in all home games this year. Sure. And if you just look at these two teams, say, since the beginning of February, make a case that this line's way out of whack because Orlando, 21 and 9 since February 1st. 
Uh, prior to that day, they were number 16 in the NBA in defense efficiency. Since that day, they are number one in defensive efficiency, allowing just 105 points per 100 possessions. So Orlando's season-long numbers aren't telling us about what the Magic have done over the last 30 games. They've been elite during that span. Maybe not top, top elite, but they've been a really good team. All that being said, do you throw all that out because this is the postseason? Maybe. You know, Orlando hasn't been there. Toronto has. Now, recent editions of the Raptors have been woeful <laughs> in round one. Certainly, when you talk about laying points with Toronto at home, it's been a bad bet. It was a bad bet throughout the Dwayne Casey era in the postseason. It's not the Dwayne Casey era anymore. Now it's the Nick Nurse era. And, of course, when we look at this Raptors squad, a couple of key guys, veteran guys, playoff veteran guys like Marcus Gasol and Kawhi Leonard, that weren't on that team last year that could give them a big boost. And, of course, Nick Nurse, now the head coach uh, for Toronto instead of Twain Casey. So it'll be at least a different approach for the Raptors this time around. You say, how's this game going to play and how's this series going to play? My mind, a lot of it has to do with bench versus bench. We're going to talk about the starters plenty, but the Raptors' greatest strength has been their depth. You know, they go 10, 11, 12 deep. They have all year. We saw it the other night with everybody sitting. They won by 20 anyway. That's Toronto. Orlando's bench has been really good down the stretch. They've been a huge part uh, of the or their extended run of success post-All-Star break. The winner of the bench, likely to have, a, you know, the bench battle, likely to have good measure of success in this series. Should be a fun one. And again, not a series that is going to attract the casual fan at all. For the NBA fan, for the real fan, this series has got a lot to offer. I, I'm looking forward to watching Raptors and Magic, both game one and moving forward. I think it'll be a very interesting and potentially competitive series. Teddy, if I was a monster truck show announcer, I would say for this one, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Oklahoma City heads to <laughs> Portland. Yes, on Sunday. Thunder uh, currently sitting at plus three right now, Ted. If we take a look offshore, sbrodds.com, again, can't get enough of this. Taking a look, they actually opened this line at four, now sitting back at three, a total of 225 in this game, 3.30 p.m. Eastern time, ABC live from the Moda Center in Portland, Oregon. The Thunder, 42-40 and 40 against the number on the season this year, 12-7, and seven, however, against the spread as a dog. But oh, how about this one, Teddy? These are always my favorite ones. The odds that we use that have no bearing on this game, one in nine against the number on Sundays. Portland, 45 and 37 against the number on the season. 31 and 20 as a favorite and 24 and 17 against the spread at home this year. So playoff history matters. I just talked a moment ago about the Raptors and their struggles in game ones, their struggles as home favorites in the postseason. Although that's potentially a different era with a new head coach and new stars on that team. For Portland, it's the same head coach and the same stars. They got swept out of the first round last year. They were favored against New Orleans. They had the first two games at home, lost them both. They were swept out of the first round the previous season as well. It's mental here for Portland right now, and the market's reacting to that uh, a little bit. And more than mental, lest I forget, Blazers had a big three. Lillard, McCollum, Nurkic. Well, McCollum hurt. He's back now. Will he be 100%? Mm, we'll see. Nurkic, not going to come back. And... That's an impact injury when you look at his replacement. Yeah, we'll see uh, some Zach Collins here. We're also going to see plenty of Enos Cantor in this ballgame. And that's a problem for Portland against OKC because one thing Cantor does not do, play low post defense. One thing the Thunder love to do with some guy named Westbrook <laughs> at the point is to penetrate and force low post defenders to make plays, which Cantor can't do. So that is a legitimate matchup edge for the road team. One a very rare situation in this series where you have the home team favored in game one, but the road team favored for the series. You don't see that a whole lot in any series. You know, you don't see it in MLB, NHL, or NBA, but the markets are saying OKC's the better squad. Steven Adams had plenty of success against Cantor uh, and matched up against Cantor when those two guys were stash brothers back in the day. But I can understand why the money's coming on OKC. Portland, for me, you better show me before I bet you because this team has been a money burner in recent postseasons, and the core of that squad is still exactly what it was. 
Teddy, I want to take a quick look at this since we have a little bit of time here on the NBA. When we take a look in the past, like it's not like you know college football or even March Madness. As we take a look at anybody can have an off game and you can knock the higher seeded team out and move forward. When you take a look at the NBA, you know the seven game series. Usually the talent does win out in the Eastern Conference. To me, it looks pretty clear that the higher seeds probably are going to win these games. Or excuse me, win the actual series. But take a look out west. If there was one series, and I know we just prefaced the last one we had here. Is there one that you might see an upset, whether it be the Jazz over the Rockets, you know, Oklahoma City? We just talked versus the Portland Trailblazers, Clippers, Warriors, or Spurs Nuggets. If you had to pick one series that you would give an upset seeding wise, which one would it be out West? Oh, it'd be OKC over Portland. I mean, Portland, uh, you know, the, the Thunder are favored for the series, which tells you all you need to know. And the Blazers don't have that postseason track record uh, and they're missing their low post stud. So that's the one that stands out. But of course, I'm taking the favorite, uh, which doesn't, you know, I don't know if that counts. The other one I would look at maybe would be Denver. Uh, getting upset by San Antonio. I do think the Spurs are capable of giving the Nuggets a real series. And one thing that is definitely different for the NBA playoffs, when you compare that to the NHL, the NFL, college football, college football, MLB, wherever you want to go, the class always wins in the NBA. And teams don't go on championship runs when they haven't been in the postseason before. So you don't see the teams coming out of nowhere in baseball, uh, or, I'm sorry, in, in the NBA, the way sometimes they do in MLB or NFL, where a team just gets hot at the right time. That doesn't happen in basketball. So I'm not looking at the these series. You know, I would expect at least six, if not seven, uh, of the favorites to uh, get out of the first round. We're not going to see that in the NHL. You never see that in MLB. You never see that in NFL. That's unique to the NBA. Yep, long grind of the NBA playoffs will be right here at sportsbookreview.com on that betting show. Be able to preview it all the way through, Teddy. It's going to seem like, you know, two months. It's going to seem like two years with how many games we're going to be able to go to. But, excuse me, go over. But it should be a lot of fun to cover. We're going to head out take a little look at a little bit of baseball, Teddy. Brew Crew head out to L.A. to battle the Dodgers. If we take a look at the lines now, the Dodgers favored minus 145, total of eight. It's going to be Urias on the mound versus Burns. Taking a look at those ERAs doesn't look like a great matchup overall. But let's take a look at the bats in these games, Teddy. Milwaukee. 385, excuse me, the Dodgers, 385 versus right-handed hitters as they waited on base average. And then if we take a look at the Dodgers going up with Urias as a lefty, the Milwaukee Brewers, Teddy, a 436 weighted on base average early in the season versus lefties. Should be a good one out in L.A. tonight. Yeah, it really should. Worth noting, though, you said the Brewers are traveling L.A. They were already in L.A. They played that's the Angels yes, and got yesterday they off. Had to get on and the bus. Hang out. Look, they had to get on a bus, Teddy. They got on a bus, all right? Yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah, they had to go from uh, from uh, uh, you know uh, <laughs> from uh, Chavez Ravine, Anaheim uh, down out to, to LA. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, yeah, that's Orange <laughs> County. But they didn't fly back east like the uh, like the Dodgers did. So it's actually a rare situation where the travel actually helps the road team. It's a better spot, travel spot for the road team than the home team. And you know, a bad series in Anaheim. You know, first time the Brewers have been swept in a three game set since last July. Uh, so. Um, obviously cooled off a fair bit after that red uh, hot start. And, of course, they uh, lost Travis Shaw yesterday. He got a bruised right hand. He was hit by a pitch in the second inning. Doesn't like he's going to go. The rookie, Corbin Burns, made 30 appearances for Milwaukee last year. He struggled his first two starts. Really, really the, the issue has been dingers. you know. Uh, but 18 strikeouts in 10 innings of work. Here's a quote from uh, Brewers manager Craig Council. Corbin is a starter for us. We made that commitment. He was in the bullpen last year. There are a lot of ingredients there for success. It's our job to help him get there. All that being said, he's not a trustworthy hurler tonight. Of course, that Brewers bullpen is pretty good uh, behind him. You talked about Urias and, and his, and, and you know, this is a guy who says reconstructed left shoulder. He's not going deep into ball games at all. And we saw that Dodger bullpen get lit up again. <laughs> and Urias got lit up his last start in Colorado. Couldn't make it out of the fourth inning there. I'm not excited about the Dodgers as chalk in this game. It'd be Brewers or pass for this better. And you might want to take a look at the over, although it depends on, you know, that, that Milwaukee bullpen comes in and shuts things down. That's never good for over betters unless the game went over already. Hey, when we take a look at some future future numbers that you take a look at Burns, it's interesting that you said that, Teddy, because giving up the home run and the long ball, but getting a lot of strikeouts, his ERA, as we said, right around that nine level, his Sierra number is only 2.66. So one of those battles of old school ERA versus new look with the Sierra that they use for the pitcher. Should be a decent one out there in L.A. We'll take a look at. But, Teddy, something special right now is really going on in Major League Baseball, and it might not be the great special that you're looking for when you find, you know, the love of your life or you get that good present. You say, boy, that's really special. 
Chris Davis, 0 for 53 now at the plate. And I bring this up only because it's a really interesting watch because of the statistical anomaly that's taking place in this. You know, still yesterday, made some hard contact on a couple balls, wasn't able to get the base hit. But an 0 for 53 nonetheless. And the one question I have for you, Teddy, is at the bottom, we talk about on the ticker, the combination of the Orioles being a really bad team, owing a ton of money to Davis, allows them to stay out there. Because if we had Chris Davis on, let's just say, the Phillies, the Yankees, or any big-name team, this guy would already be part and parcel to say, hey, look, take three weeks off and just get your act together before you come back. But the Orioles not really going anywhere saying, hey, let's see how this thing plays out. Yeah, exactly. Work it out, kid. You'll be fine. (laughs) Just keep swinging. So for this season, he's only 0 for 32 with 16 strikeouts. You know, that's not too bad, right? Yeah, (laughs) this is a chance we get to make fun of someone. And look, I'm making fun of a very rich man. Chris Davis will have more money in his pocket right now than you and I will ever have combined, Donnie. (laughs) You know, we're not signing $150 million deals. But when you (laughs) sign one of those deals, you got to produce. And when you go 0 for 53, I mean, some of it's bad luck. Some of it's bad hitting. And yeah. Uh, The fact that he's getting booed every night. And you know they're going to be razzing him like crazy in Boston all weekend long. I mean, I hope for his sake he finally gets a hit. You know, but then again, one for 54 doesn't do all that much for me either. No, it doesn't bring it up too much there for us. On the grind, getting the knowledge is what we do here at That Betting Show. April 12, 2019, once again, your one-stop shop for all your sports betting needs. The weekend this year, we'll be able to cover the Masters winner on Monday. First round of the NBA tournament, excuse me, the NBA playoffs. A lot to go over, but we'll be back on Monday to go over all that stuff. He's Teddy Sobranski. Give him a follow once again on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. I'm Donnie Seymour, right side VP. Enjoy the weekend, and we'll catch you back here on Monday.